Yes, uh, we got about, well, we're on countdown basically right now, but yes. Okay. All right, well, let's get started. Hi, this is Mary Beth Harrison with Dallas Native Team, and uh, we are on our live today, and I have our guest today. I'm so excited. I'm my, one of my favorite people, uh, Jason Browning with Academy Mortgage. Welcome, and I just, I can't wait doing? to hear the what the heck's going on now <laughs> conversation. <laughs> it's like, let's see, today is, uh, let's see, okay, we'll do that today. <laughs> so I'm curious to see. Exactly. And, as always, Candace Barnes is watching over our shoulder. So if you all have questions, uh, please go to the chat box, not the Q&A, but to the chat box, and she'll watch over that and interrupt us if it pertains to what we're talking to right now, or if not, we'll catch it at the end and answer all the questions. So, oh my goodness, let's talk about the loan business these days. Um, it's it, it seems like things are going fairly smoothly as far as getting loans through and and all of that what do you attribute that to because i'm not finding as much hysteria as maybe we were even a year ago yeah you know i think a lot of that mary beth is uh you know doing the prep work up front uh, at least from our standpoint we're not having that you know um reactive uh type of a transaction everything has been proactive um so yeah we're as long as we're poised and, and have done the pre-approval correctly uh, pre underwritten the file, it takes a lot of that last minute stress. And you know, we've already got the groundwork laid there to, to have a very Let, smooth transaction. And then also about communication too. Yeah. Let's talk about pre approval because that is, that's not a little thing. It's everything. Once you've made the decision to buy a house, you have got, got to go do your homework. First of all, why in the world would I show you a $500,000 house when what you can afford or want to afford? Because there's two different issues here. We look really good on paper, Jason. I'm telling you, when you run our credit score, it's like, <laughs> oh, you can afford this. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, who's going to pay for that? Um, so it's, it's, it's two issues. One, what can you afford? What will the lender loan for you? But the flip side is, are you comfortable with that? You know, it's kind of like buying a car. I don't really care what the car costs. Can I afford those payments or not? over the period of time. It, it's that simple. And what I love about working with you is I can tell my clients to approach you with, I want my payment to be X, and then you turn that into a loan, and then whatever they've saved to put down, now we've reached what we need to be looking for. So I love that you work forwards or backwards, as I call it, uh, because or you can certainly just look at it and go with your credit score and your, you know, everything you have going on, you can afford 500,000 and then that would equal these payments. And then we back into it. Are you comfortable with that? But let's talk about pre-approval. What all do you need from our clients to get pre-approved? Now, what that means is the buyer is credit worthy. We still don't know about the house. That's a whole other issue, but at a minimum, the, the buyer could move forward and buy this house. Yeah, so uh, Mary Beth, one of the things we like to call it here is just the ability to repay. That's what we're looking at, right? Uh, so what a concept. Uh, what we do in that situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very, very basic, right? Can you can you pay us back? And you know, what does your credit profile look like in order to pay us back, right? So um, you know, what we do is we have an initial conversation with every client, um, and really what we're trying to do there is just identify what they're wanting to do, uh, whether it be a certain purchase price range, a certain budget, a certain uh, down payment. Uh, income, you know, type of uh, uh, how they're paid. Uh, so, and then as we do that, we just say, hey, we need you to get us just a few documents, you know, W-2s, pay stubs, asset statements, bank statements, where the money's coming from, from the down payment, even if it's a gift, you know, what have you, uh, your ID, uh, and that's really it, unless you're self-employed. And then we would ask for your last two years of tax returns as well. Um, and then we have you complete an application where we, we take a look at your credit report. Uh, and then we just try to, like you said, work backwards there uh, and find out, you know, if you want to have X amount of payment, you know, this is what that'll buy you. Um, if you're going to go the other way and say, hey, I want a $500,000 house, you know, this is what that payment's going to be. And, and again, we also just kick the tires on, hey, um, just in case you find your dream home out there, I mean, like you just can't you know, live without it. You're approved up to X, but, you know, again, that's above what you wanted to spend, but you do have that purchasing power. Um, so that's what that conversation and how that process works. That's, that's good to know. And, and, and it's just, it's so, so important. I mean, looking for a house is um, stressful enough and to fall in love with something that you can't have, 
that's crazy. And, and two, uh, let's say you're looking at a $300,000 house, that that's what you want to afford. That's where you fall in and then turn around and start, I'd start showing you $400,000 houses. Well, 400,000 should look better than 300,000. I mean, come on, <laughs> or it should be more square footage or more something, right? I mean, it, it it's like saying I want steak for dinner or I'll be happy with an apple. I either one will be fine. You know, it's like, <laughs> wait, what? You know, and so there just there's just no reason to fall in love with something you can't have. So I, I just can't stress enough this pre approval to get that going to understand where do we need to be. And to what plays into it, Jason, too, is what's the down payment situation. So let's talk about that, because I think people walk in thinking I got to put down 20 percent. Well, no, you don't. So talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a very low percentage of Americans nowadays that are putting 20 percent down. And, and in fact, you know, in most situations, I would recommend against it just because money is so inexpensive and you can have that money working better for you elsewhere if you decided to do that. Uh, but when you're looking at it from a standpoint of uh, down payment, you really want to identify what type of loan you want to go with. So if you're a veteran, that's going to have a different avenue. You, know, you can go as little as nothing down. Uh, but if you're you know, looking to do a first time home buyer loan, you have a couple of options there. You can do a 3% down. Uh, you can also do a 3.5% down. Uh, so those can get you with a very minimal out-of-pocket uh, and get you a very affordable rate and payment uh, going that route. Um, so, and again, one of the things to speak to there too, when we go back through this and, and we try to identify down payment, we try to look at your credit report, your application, we actually go ahead and pre-underwrite your file. So you're ready to go. Uh, and I can't tell you how uh, just the, the, the good feeling you get when you can call that listing agent that you just made an offer on and say, hey, when would you like to close this loan? Our client is ready to go. Uh, and that just has a lot of weight to it. Well, you're also able to write the, the contract when you use third party finance and check the box that says our buyer is already pre-approved, that he doesn't need, he or she does not need um, that period of time to do to, to get qualified. It, it makes them such a strong buyer. And in the market that we've certainly been in and really continue to be in to a point, we'll pick it up again in the spring. I mean, we'll see this market get hot and heavy again like that. But when there's several people vying for the same house as a seller, let me ask you, do you want the, the buyer that gosh, I really hope and pray that they can get their loan. Or do you want the buyer that is put to bed, ready to go? All I need is a house to go with the loan. Wh which one do you want as a seller? I mean, put yourself in the seller's shoes um, and the exactly agent right. for that matter. And I love too, that you will call the other agent. I love that, that you will call and go, hey, we've got a strong buyer here, got everything I need. I mean, barring any unforeseen, he lost his job, we're ready to go, you know? And so that's really important. Yeah, and to, and to that point, talking about communication, uh, it, you know, it's not only at that moment where, you know, we're trying to get the offer accepted, you know, communication is key throughout the entire process. You know, our team takes pride in saying that you should never have to pick up the phone and saying, what's going on with our mortgage? So we call both agents, you, and we call the listing agent, and we call the client, we even call the title company and give everyone an update of where we're at that particular week. That's a weekly call uh, along with uh, emails as we move through the different milestones of a, of a loan. It is, that is everything. It's, it's not a small thing. It is everything. I, when, when uh, a buyer comes to me and wants to go to ABC mortgage company and, and worse, abc.com mortgage company, that's <laughs> even more horrifying to me the chances of speaking to the same person twice is about slim and none. And I, I just can't stress enough. You're, you're going to be living with us for a while. <laughs> Might as well move in, you know, between it, between, you know, the, the realtor taking you through the process, explaining everything, staying in touch with you, getting you through inspections, negotiations, and whatever else can come along. It's the same thing with your lender. You need to be able to have a conversation that's, you know, direct and true. And, and so we can move forward smoothly because that's all any of us want. I mean, this really should be fun. Really buying a home 
should be fun. I mean, it just, it's, it's exciting. It's stressful. I get that, but gosh, it should be a good time. It should be a, a pleasant, positive experience. And if you don't have the right team working with you, it can go awry just like that. Um, something else I want to talk about, Jason, because it's recently come up and I, I explain this to my clients when they're starting their loan search as it were is first of all you don't get your credit will not be dinged you won't get you won't see it go down because you talk to multiple lenders that's important it's the same thing as if you were shopping for a car that as long as it's all for cars then that was a law that was passed many years ago so that a consumer could shop for the best exactly. whatever but the thing i find interesting is my clients kind of focus on rate rates are I mean, everyone goes to the same well for their water it's not like you get your money any cheaper than anyone else does rates are rates and they change daily and if it gets volatile out there it can change during the day i mean i've i've been with you when, times, it, actually, yeah. right, <laughs> when, when the market's going nuts or whatever's happened out there and the lenders change those rates within hours so when i hear that you all are calling mortgage companies and and talking about rate it's fairly irrelevant because unless you call them within the same hour the rates are the rates but what is important really really important is the level of service and the closing cost that's where you get some of these dot com whatever i've seen closing costs that are crazy 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 nuts and so um any other suggestions about that well yeah you're you're on point there with uh you know having your credit looked at you know again it would uh, it wouldn't behoove you if that first lender uh, had the best uh, credit score right and then everyone else had to get a lower credit score to try to offer you the same uh, same program uh right. so yes you're you're absolutely accurate on that um, and when it comes to rate, you know, typically the lowest rate is going to have the highest cost. I mean, we have a, a rate that is like, oh, I would blow your socks off, but hey, what does it cost to get that? And that's where that fine print comes in, or you have to have a certain amount down or a certain loan amount or a certain credit score. And you'll get this dot com that will, you know, basically just respond to your, your email or just respond to an application without verifying anything, saying, here's your rate. And, you know, at the end of the day, when all the dust settles, is that really what you were able to walk away with? Um, and we always like to say when we quote you a rate and we quote you a program, that's what we're going to close with. Uh, and, um, yeah, so that's where you kind of get into those challenges of, uh, of not, not getting what you were told. Um, and that, you know, rate is, again, rate is important, but to me, it's payment service, right? And, you know, we just asked our clients right off, of, right off the bat, do you trust me? Do you trust me to make sure that we're putting you in the best program for you and your family in your future? And if you can say yes to that, then, you know, we're going to put you in the best mortgage that, uh, that's out there for sure. Yeah, it's the same thing as your realtor. They need to be, you're looking at all the pretties and they should be looking at the cracks over the doors or the cabinets that pull away or, you know, we're, we're looking at the structural and you all are looking at the pretty, you know, you want someone that's going to have the, the nerve to say to you, this isn't your house. You know, I'm really concerned about this and, and let's go find another one because this is not it. And, and you want that in your, in your, lender as well you want someone to go you know guys this is really pushing you and and i think we've all discussed the fact that when you do buy a house i want to be able to have the house and someone call and go hey we have a free beach house let's go down i want door number one door number two i don't well no we just bought a house we can't go do that no i want you to have a life to go with your house not the house be your life that's that's not what any of us want yeah, we call that being house poor. I mean, you just poured everything into getting into it and you, you're stuck there. You cannot have any uh, right. of the fun stuff that you were able to do prior to buying a home. So, um, you know, that always comes into that, you know, having that, uh, uh, that mortgage planning session with us because we can really dive in and say, hey, you could really buy this house uh, and we're going to qualify you on your gross income, like what you bring, uh, not what you bring home, but what your pay stubs say you make per hour before taxes are taken out. And so that's a, we all know that's a different animal when you actually all the taxes and all your insurance and all that comes up. What do you have left over at the end of the, uh, at the end of the pay period? You know, that's what we're trying to work with and, and put you in the best loan uh, right. for your family, your situation, for your budget. 
Yeah, no one wants to see you. Yeah, no one wants to see this go any other direction. That's just that's just not a good life, and that's not what any of us want. So let's talk about some. Candace, are there any uh, things yeah. that we need to stop and answer? Yeah, let's let's answer a few questions. Um, let's start off with what is the difference between FHA and a conventional loan? Uh, I was just going to move into that, so that's great. Good question. Okay, yeah, so um, they're both great programs. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll see that FHA, you know, kind of has, uh, uh, is looked at in a bad light, which, you know, again, it's a great loan program, and, and I don't necessarily agree with, you know, kind of looking at it that way, but that's more of a, a seller situation. Uh, but an FHA loan is, um, uh, w you know, basically one of these is going to be guaranteed by FHA, and the other one is just a conventional loan that goes to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, uh, and those are more um, uh, credit score based. You know, as far as like the better your credit score, the better the the, the uh, rate's going to be, the better just the overall uh, loan, your mortgage insurance and so forth. Uh, the FHA loan allows for a little bit of a lower credit score. Um, it allows for a higher debt ratio. So if you if uh, if the income is a little tight, that you know they have some forgiveness forgiveness there. Um, so and, and again, if you're a first time home buyer, the conventional everyone thinks that the FHA is a little bit better because you can do it three and a half percent down. Well, you can actually do it three percent down on conventional. So that's one of those myths that's out there that the, the least amount down is always FHA, and, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, but uh, you know, mortgage insurance is different on both of those. You know, sometimes the FHA is going to be a little bit higher with somebody uh, that has a higher credit score, and then vice versa. That mortgage insurance is going to be cheaper, uh, and the rate's going to be better uh, on a conventional loan versus the uh, the FHA. But they're very good programs. Uh, again, a lot of the times I'll have someone that can qualify for both, and then we just want to look at which is the absolute best loan for you. And then that's when I'll tell you, and we'll put together an analysis for you that shows you that. And then you're just looking at cost over time, rate, you know, cost monthly, things of that nature. One thing I want to ask, Jason, I think I am correct about this, but I've certainly been wrong once or twice in my life, so this may be that time. Uh, once. Only once. I, I, I remember that day. On an FHA loan, um, the MIP, Mortgage Insurance Premium, and on a conventional loan, it's uh, private mortgage insurance. And the whole point there is when you don't put down a lot of money on a house, the lender thinks that you can walk away. I mean, what's to not walk away? Let's take a hundred thousand dollar house. Three percent is only three thousand dollars. I mean, three thousand dollars. You're going to blow that on a trip, bunch of grocery stores, and some Starbucks. You know, you've pretty much gone through it. Yep. So, walking away from this house becomes an easy decision, or an easier decision. And so, they want some skin in the game. They want some protection so that should you quit paying and foreclose, they have a little checkbook sitting there that can sustain this house while they try to sell it. So if you think like a lender, that's really the bottom line is, are these buyers going to stick with it? Are they going to see it through to the end? Right? Yeah, exactly. Right, right back to that uh, ability to repay that, that, you, that we talked about a, a moment ago. Right. Um, and, and just a little bit more about that, uh, the mortgage insurance, PMI, MIP. Um, so what that truly is from a lending standpoint, it's more of an insurance policy for the lender. Like mm -hmm. you said, if the borrower decides they want to stop paying and walk away, it gives them some capital to go back and rehab the home, get it ready to sell so they can recoup some of the money there. Um, and uh, another of the differences of those two types of loans, mortgage insurance on, on both, uh, the FHA loan, that mortgage insurance never falls off. So you're going to be on there for the life of the loan unless you refinance. Uh, conventional loan, there's an end, there's an end game to that. It actually falls off once you reach 20% equity, and in our market, that's happening sooner rather than later, just because of the level right. of appreciation these homes are having. So, you know, some people could be in there for two or three years with mortgage insurance, as opposed to in previous years, it would be on there for five to seven years or so. Right. Uh, so that's uh, another uh, difference in those two types of programs. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to bring up is just the three percent down conventional. At the end of the day, either you've made payments to eat up that 20% from the 3% you put down, or the house is appreciated, but somewhere in there, there's a 20% gap of what you owe versus what the house is worth. And so that does make that conventional loan a little more um, appealing at the end of the day. One thing I do want to go back and address, because you mentioned about sellers seeing an FHA loan and going, Rawr. it doesn't cost the seller one penny, not one penny more in closing costs or any obligation to the, used to be, they you know they had to pay for certain things and that's not true anymore, not on VA or FHA. 
There is nothing right. that a buyer cannot pay for on a VA loan or an FHA loan. Nothing. So go ahead. Including if the value comes in low, they can actually pay that difference, which is a myth out there that, you know, you don't sign that appraisal waiver, but you still I can actually have a, a, an appraisal come in light, which again, we don't you know, really see that here, but if an appraisal comes in light, you can still pay the difference on an FHA and a VA loan. Make so, up the difference um, between what the appraised value and the, yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. Really good point. Um, and VA of course is strictly for military past or present. Yes. And that's it's correct. a, it is a gift in my opinion. It is a, a precious gift that is given to our veterans and well deserved. So for going out there and keeping us safe, we give you the ability to buy a house with nothing down. They certainly can put money down, but they don't have to. And so that's only for veterans, uh, both current um, active military and past. So, um, yes. And like we said before, that's a zero down payment. There's no monthly mortgage insurance on that either. So, yeah. I mean, that's a, if you're a veteran, again, and we thank all of our veterans for their service. I'm a veteran myself, uh, but it's go. one of those things that that's just a, a great program uh, for yeah. our veterans. Uh, allows them to, to really uh, increase their purchasing power based on, they, they, I mean, they can go down to a 580 credit score, you know, no money down. Um, so, it's, it's, a, it's a really strong, a very strong loan for them. Yeah. Um, I want to go back one step. On the FHA loan, the limit on that, the loan limit on that is now, I think you said 411,700. So that equals out to about a 425,000 ish purchase. And then you put your 3.5% down and you end up with that loan amount. So if you're wanting to do an FHA loan, that that's gone up considerably. I mean, it used to be in the 300,000s. Now it's, it's really jumped up to about 425 ish, uh, 425,000 purchase price on on a home so that's really that's a great that's that's huge and then conventional loan has to be at 625 is that right yeah 625 is all the noise that we're hearing right now that that's uh that's what the the new conforming uh they call it loan limit conventional loan limit um, right. everyone's starting to lend at that uh, dollar amount on a conventional loan so again that's the loan amount not the purchase price so Again, you can go anywhere from 3% to 5% down and kind of back into that number uh, oh, if right. need be. Uh, and also, you know, within the next 45 days or so, you know, 60 days, we'll know uh, what the next year, 2022, what the loan limit's going to be for FHA. It goes up every year. Uh, okay. So it's going to be even higher than that four, eleven, uh, seven hundred here shortly. Good to know. And jumbo loans, goodness, they, the interest rates on those are crazy. It used to be a jumbo loan uh, brought a, a, a much larger or higher interest rate. It, it was like conventional interest rate was here, jumbo rate was here. Well, now they're just almost the same, if not even a little bit lower. It's like, that's crazy. So we used to have to kind of scoot around to try and get people to not have to do a jumbo loan. And now, shoot why not you know it's not as scary as it once was you're absolutely right uh right. you know the only thing that you're looking at with the uh, with the jumbo loan is you can't get away with three percent down i mean no. there's going to be a little bit more of a down payment uh but like you said those programs those rates are extremely attractive uh yeah. and uh and again they're not the the scary uh, uh route to go like they like they once were so yeah. and a lot of the times we're gonna you know we're gonna underwrite those in-house so we don't have to send those over to you know the dot coms to, to look at it it's all done in-house that's great that's good to know candace do we have some more questions i'm seeing let's jump in so the next question we have is what is the preferred credit score to buy a home and i guess you're going to kind of break that up from fha to conventional va so that way people kind of understand and and before you even start i will say the higher the better yes. and your rates go better with so keep going jason okay. <laughs> take that away yeah i was gonna say i was gonna say 850 but uh you know um no uh, <laughs> uh, you know again um you know credit credit score and trying to figure that out uh is, is you know it takes a phd honestly to try to really understand what what does what to the credit scores and you know sometimes we'll look at an overall credit profile and say you know how's the score where it is based on what i'm seeing but, um, you know, when you're trying to go with a government loan, a, a VA and an FHA, you know, we can get onto a 580 credit score. Again, the higher, the better. Um, and then on a, a USDA loan, which is, you know, a rural loan, which we don't do here in, in, the, in the Metroplex, that's more for the rural development uh, areas. Uh, they can go down to a 620 as, as well. 
Uh, and then when you're looking at a conventional, we can go down to a 620. Uh, so again, you get, we've gotten extremely aggressive on, uh, on getting those credit scores down to qualify for a home. But again, the higher, the better for sure. Yeah. The, your rates go accordingly. So if the lower your interest rate, am I, I mean, sorry, the lower your credit score, the higher your interest rate. Am I correct? Yes, uh, there is going to be a, a, you know, that is going to correlate um, not so much on the FHA and the VA. So there's still going to be a, right. a little bit higher than if you had to say a 740 <laughs> or 800 or what have you. Uh, but the really the magic number to qualify for the best rates in terms on a conventional, if you just want to say, I want to make sure I get the lowest rate, the lowest amount of cost, is really run around a 720 to a 740. Uh, that's going to get you into the best uh, conventional rates. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that they're far off from a 680 or 640, 660. Uh, but uh, again, on a conventional, the higher uh, the credit score, just the overall better terms you're going to see. Another thing I love about working with you, Jason, is is uh, foregoing the ease of the whole transaction, forgetting that part of it. But I love that you can counsel uh, and will counsel our buyers. So when they come to you and they have a few things on there that if they were to pay them off, it would adjust their credit score. And so the, if, if you're thinking about buying a home and maybe you're thinking in the next six months or the next year, whatever, it's not too soon to stop and have a conversation so that Jason can look at your, at your overall credit score and go, you know, if you would pay off your Walmart, card, <laughs> whatever, you know, um, or bring your car payment down, you know, a little bit, or just, you know, let, let's get this credit card out of there, any of those things, then you'll watch your credit score jump up. And so sooner rather than later to have these conversations is a good thing. Um, I think sometimes yeah, I, I, there's no such thing as too early, honestly. Yeah. I, I, I mean, when was the last time you look at your credit score, unless you're trying to buy, get a loan or buy a car, I, you know, who, no one looks at their credit score. Very few of us look at our credit score. And all of a sudden you see a late payment on AT&T that it's like, no, I wasn't, you know, I can show you where it was paid. And so being able to go back and refute some of that is really important. So there are things that crop up on there that we didn't even know were there, uh, which is really frustrating, really, really frustrating. So, um, yeah. And, and to this point, I would say, uh, you know, during that mortgage planning session, you know, we're going to be able to identify those little opportunities to, you know, let's just say that you're at a 638 and we can do something very minor to get you to a 7, four, I'm sorry, a, six, a 738. And we can do something minor to get you to a 740. You know, we can go over that. Uh, another factor in that also is going to be how much time do we have? So if we're further out, we have more time, we can really dig in and get those scores up rather quickly. Uh, your credit report is good for 120 days. Uh, oh. So we, that gives us a lot of flexibility without having to repull it, uh, you know, in the near future to to really kind of tackle those things. Um, one of the things that you kind of talked about the, the credit scoring uh, that we get a lot, you probably get somewhat as well, but definitely on the lending side is when we're talking to our um, our clients, your clients uh, on that initial conversation, you know, we ask them to grade themselves on their credit. Would you say it's excellent, good, fair, or poor? And if anyone answers less than excellent, I'm going to say, why is your credit not excellent? Um, and then so we kind of dive into that. Uh, but one of the things that we're getting a lot of, and we've gotten this for the last, you know, probably two or three years, four years, five years, something like that, is the uh, services that report your credit score, whether it be from your credit card, Credit Karma is a real big one. There's a couple of other ones out there. Uh, but just so you know that that is not a true mortgage credit score. You can call me and say, hey, your credit score says, uh, you know, it's a 740. You know, you're probably looking at about a 50 point variance there uh, because mm -hmm. of the different algorithms uh, that those uh, uh, those different folks run uh, to give you your scores. Uh, so uh, sometimes we're surprised that they're actually higher than Credit Karma, but on average, Credit Karma and those types of uh, services usually have your score higher than it truly is. So that's why it's great to get this conversation started early. That way you know where you truly sit, you know, if there uh, needs to be anything done to get you to the best rates and terms, or, hey, I, you know, my lease is up in, you know, two months, uh, you know, as long as you can get me qualified, then we can work on, you know, something after that, you know, we can, we can definitely have those conversations for sure. I, th I think you all can clearly see how much work is done long before you ever actually buy a home. And something that I, it's come up very recently with us and, and I want to address it. And, and that is, I, you know, 
We're the best game in town between realtors and lenders. Honestly, where else can you walk in and start having someone work for you and not owe them a penny until you actually perform at the end of the of the row? I mean, you can't go to your attorney, your CPA, your doctor. I don't think you can go in the library. I don't think you get to do any of those things without <laughs> paying as you go. But once you, when you call your realtor to start your home search, I start working for you while I'm talking to you on the phone. I mean, the time that it takes to to figure out what what your criteria is, the best place in Dallas to be, and then to start showing you homes, we don't get paid for that. We don't get paid as we go. It's a service that we offer and we offer it gladly. And Jason's the same way. The minute that he picks up that telephone, he starts working. And so to to it, you know, it's the old dance with the one that brung you. That's a really good country western right, song. Right. Yep, it's like yep, once you've it. made the commitment to to us, know that we have already made a commitment to you. Um, and so you don't owe us a penny. We don't get paid until we get to the end of the row and you have purchased a home or Jason has finished your loan and it's closed and you fund it. That's, that's the soonest any of us see any of this. And so to understand basically how we work, that's it. We start working from you the minute we pick up that telephone and we don't stop working for you weekends, nights, the phone calls, the all of it. And we do it gladly. It's what we do. It's what we both love about this business or we wouldn't be in it. We'd be finding something else to do. Especially but, for this long. Uh, yeah, especially for this long. Yeah. And so it's, you know, <laughs> Jason, I always laughingly tell people, I, it's like, you know, I just want you to think that like we're engaged and I don't want you dating anybody else. You know, it's just that simple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once you've made Absolutely. the commitment, know that I've already made a commitment to you and we expect that same commitment back to us. And and we're fine if you're not, if you're not happy, we're not happy. So understand right. if you're not happy, then be honest enough to let us know that. And, and go find someone whose personality or work ethic or whatever does match you. Um, because we're not all, you know, we're not all meant to work together. I get that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm an acquired taste. I get that. <laughs> and so. Well, um, and like, one, like, just like you were saying there that my about that, uh, you know, we work in, in, in uh, basically from, in good faith. We're going to do everything we can in good faith uh, to get you there. And we're not even talking about the people behind the scenes. You're just talking about me and you. We're right. not talking about the Candices or the Nadias behind the scene that are absolutely busting the, their hump to, to get it done for us as well. And right. again, I think that's where that communication comes in too. So, you know, I'm going to ask you, do you trust us? Do you trust me to, to provide that level of service? And if you say yes, like you said, we're engaged. We're not, we're not uh, seeing other people. We're, we're breaking up our relationships and, and we're ready to go. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And, and again, we do this uh, with a smile on our face because that's what it is. And that commitment really? to you is when you call us, we're going to pick up the phone. Whether that's on Sunday, whether that's on Saturday or, you know, in the evenings, uh, yeah, we're going to be there for you all the way through. And Lord knows I have called you at all of those weekends. Sunday. <laughs> Tell me what you think about this. Candice, let's go to another question. I see some standing there. Um, so you mentioned USDA loans, and I, I am seeing a lot of this. And this was a question. I think people are seeing this up on billboards because builders are starting to build kind of outside a little bit more. And expanding so those usda loans are now starting to come up quite a bit um kind of explain what that is because i think a lot of people moving here from out of state um i think that's a question that's coming up a lot yeah so the usda like we said before it's going to be a rural loan uh, and it's all based on the census when they do the population you know, you know take the population count every 10 years then they're going there and they're going to go to these areas that are not as developed so you start having to get outside the Metroplex a little further, you know, up past Melissa, Aubrey, uh, you know, so, you know, down past uh, Waco, Waxahachie. Just, you know, it's going to be out in the sticks. It's going to be a little bit more rural, uh, but that's where you're going to qualify because it's based on the population. Um, and as we continue to grow here in Texas and you know, everyone moving here from California or what have you, you know, those areas are still, you know, they're dwindling as you get closer to the Metroplex. Um, you know, if you can actually just Google USDA uh, and there's an interactive map right there, you can you know, drop a pin on that map or type in an address and it will tell you uh, if it's a USDA eligible area. Uh, very, very simple. Um, and uh, and that's, that's as easy as it gets really. 
I, so it has nothing to do with the size of the land. It's the area that it's in. I really, I've learned something today. I really was not aware that USDA loan could be in a subdivision, but where that subdivision is, oh, yeah. is the catch. That's interesting. Okay, we'll see. I learn something new every day. Yeah. What's our next question, Candace? Yeah. Um, so the next question we have is, is there a down payment assistance? And are there, and, and second question, are there programs for certain job types? Oh, that's a good question. Oh yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, so there are down payment assistance programs out there. Uh, you know, there's um, there's several of them. Uh, some of them are, are better for certain industries, like you know our first responders, teachers, nurses, firefighters, you know police officers, uh, things of that nature. Um, so yes, there are down payment assistance programs. They can you know they vary anywhere from you know three percent assistance. Uh, there's one real aggressive out there that uh, it could be up to eight percent assistance. Now again. Mm -hmm. Those are the uh, types of programs that, you know, you, can, you, you can't call me and say, hey, I need you to negotiate a little bit of a lower rate. Those rates are determined by those programs. And, you know, usually they're, they're not the best rates on the board just because they're giving you free money. Uh, so it kind of makes sense. It kind of goes hand in hand. Um, now, again, sometimes we look at these, uh, you know, when we have this uh, mortgage planning session, we look at their, our analysis. You know, we'll put together uh, a down payment assistance loan, and then we'll put together, uh, you know, a, a, one other program for you. And we'll see, is the down payment assistance really the best way to go? Uh, and again, down payment assistance doesn't mean you're going to always come to the table with no money down. Uh, and it's going to assist you with some of that money down, but there are closing costs involved as well. So you just really got to weigh the two options or three options uh, and see which one is going to be best for your budget and long-term goals uh, as well. Um, and again, I hope that answered the question as well about different types of professions. Uh, you know, there's doctor loans out there as well, you know, for someone that's in their fellowship, um, but, uh, you know, mainly for the down payment assistance, that's, you know, you get a little bit of a, um, a better deal there if, you, if, uh, if you're in one of those preferred professions. But they still have them for, for everyone, honestly. Is there still the Hometown Hero Program? Is that still named what that is? The Hometown Hero Absolutely. Program is for any first responder, uh, frontline nurses, all those. It was, uh, yeah, that's a really cool loan. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah that's, that's once, cool. once, you know, Jason talks to you and hears what your profession is, then he's better able to kind of open up avenues for you that um, that I wouldn't possibly know about, quite frankly. I mean, it's not my job. I don't I don't do lending. I know enough to be dangerous, <laughs> but that's not my not what I do. Uh, what's the next question, Candace? Sure. So is there a limit of how much money is available in these programs and do they need to be applying them at a certain time of the year? Yeah, so these are government programs. So if you're, you know, there, there's a certain amount of money that they allot for these programs at the beginning of each year. Mm -hmm. uh, have we had, we've had previous years where they've run out of money. Mm -hmm. So it, it has happened. Um, it, you know, it's happened less and less uh, as, as time has gone on, but it still happens. I mean, you know, we've gone in there to, to register one of these and there's no more funds. Uh, that's, a, that's a horrible uh, thing to have to tell someone, yeah. but it, it hasn't happened to us in a little while, but yes, so that question, um, uh, it has happened. Now, as far as the, um, uh, you said for the amount of money uh, that they can they, they can get, I believe this was the question. Um, again, it can, it, in certain programs, it can be all the way up 8% of the loan amount. Uh, so you take your $100,000, you take off 3%, so that's $97,000. So 8% of that is the max. Um, and again, there's some, you know, certain guidelines you have to uh, qualify for for that type of loan, but uh, that's where it all kind of jumps off is the loan amount and a percentage of that. Right. Your qualifications, and I want to make that really clear. It's not like you can come in with really horrible credit or it's still the same, the same um, things apply, whether it's this loan or that loan, you still have to be credit worthy, uh, might be a little less of a credit score uh, uh, ability, like an FHA accepts a little lower, but, but you can't walk in having really bad credit and make this happen. So please understand that. What's the next question? Yeah, getting back to that ability to repay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how much is closing <laughs> cost? Um, we've gotten this question a lot over and over again. Um, and I think you even get these questions from buyers, especially first time home buyers and even seasoned um, buyers that haven't bought a home maybe in several years. And those, the loan qualifications have kind of changed and all the details have kind of changed or somebody's moving from out of state and they don't really understand how our system works. So kind of explain how that closing cost works, as Mary Beth kind of touched on it a minute ago about the rates, 
But what people really need to be focused on, not to say that rates aren't important, but the bottom line is, is when you go to closing table and what that actually looks like. Yeah, that's a very great question. Uh, so there's going to be a little bit of a sliding scale on some of the fees, and it's going to be all based on the loan amount and how much you're putting down. Uh, but then you're going to have some fees that uh, are fixed, like our lender costs are fixed. They're $1,550 per transaction, so $1,550. bucks. They do not change no matter what the loan size is. Now, once you start getting into uh, that loan amount changing or purchase price changing, you know, like some of the title fees will adjust because they are a percentage of the actual uh, loan amount. So when that slides, um, you know, that's going to go up or down depending on that. Uh, and then some of the other closing costs based on like appraisal is usually a fixed cost depending on if we need to get a rush appraisal or something like that. Uh, but a survey fee, is, if you need one, that's typically a pretty – you know, standard cost, you know, it doesn't really fluctuate much unless you're buying massive acreage or something like that. Um, and then the, the closing fees, as far as like uh, the title company closing the loan, a settlement fee, they call it. Um, so those types of things are fixed as well. So the one that just really, really moves the most is going to be that uh, title insurance. Uh, and that's going to be mainly based on, uh, you know, what you're financing. I'm Beth, I know you're, you're really good at answering this question um, because people ask this all the time of you is, okay, I'm selling my house for $300,000. Give me a baseline. Oh, of closing costs? Mm -hmm. um, I, I assume your closing costs will be approximately 8 to 8.5%. 8 and that's, um, I try to throw in everything I can think of. The only thing I don't include there is your tax liability, because I never know when we're going to close or what current tax rate is. But that takes into account, um, Realtor commissions, title policy, um, escrow fees, basically everything I can think of, even some minor repairs I throw in there. So that's a, I, I'm not far off. I, I'm usually pretty spot on when I sit at a closing table and look at my, their closing costs versus what I thought it was going to be uh, when I took the listing. And so, um, so yeah, eight to eight and a half percent is, is very, that, that covers a lot of problems there. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, and that's uh, like you were mentioning, that's on a purchase. So on the, on the, uh, buying so, side of that, I would say it's probably going to be that other, you know, probably two to two and a half percent, give or take, depending on the loan size. So the higher the loan, the lesser percentage. Um, well, that's an interesting, I've really kind of never had a percentage. Good to know. Two, mm -hmm. two percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. Yeah, give or take, it also depends on if the seller is going to pay the title policy. That's that plays a yes, big part in it as well. That is that's that yeah. is a, that's a lot probably the largest expense on a closing statement uh, for a seller. And there are so many things that are negotiable in our contracts too. Mm -hmm. um, question: Do you have to escrow? No, you don't. Uh, but the one factor on that is if you don't want to escrow, you got to put twenty percent down, mm -hmm. and you have to be on a conventional mortgage. Okay, that helps out a lot. Okay, and then um, I'm getting questions, so I'm just going to ask these. Yeah, no, so, just one of three. Um, yeah. The other question is: Is can you pay your mortgage? Can you like double up your mortgage so that way, if your mortgage yes. is X, can I say I want to pay another mortgage on top of that? In other words, the, absolutely. Let me, yeah, maybe sure I understand. Are you talking two houses, two mortgages? No, like one house, you want to pay two payments. Absolutely. No, uh, I tell my clients all the time, if you make one extra payment a year, that's all it takes mm -hmm. to take a 30-year loan down to what, 20-something, and then a 15-year note. 24, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, it takes a lot off, and that's just one extra payment. And that's principal and interest. So if you take your principal and interest payment, let me make it easy right now and say it's $1,200 principal and interest, not taxes and insurance, just principal and interest. So divide that by 12 and make an extra hundred dollar payment a month mm -hmm. to principal. That's important. Yes. And you've made one extra payment a year, or let's say you get a bonus in December and you want to make an extra $1,200 payment in December. Absolutely. Anything you can do to bring that, that principle down you just want again you want to be really sure that it goes to the principal and not to the escrows not to taxes and insurance so absolutely yeah and you can make a note i would recommend one thing oh sorry go ahead yeah. go ahead yeah i was just going to say there make one uh, what i typically recommend is if you're going to do that just make a separate checkout and write in the little notes box there that it is to principal um and again that that uh, as mary beth said one extra payment a year can cut 
you know, five to seven years uh, off of your mortgage. And, and as that principal goes down, you're just paying less interest. So it's, uh, it's twofold on the savings. You're getting the home sooner, uh, paid off sooner, and then the interest that you're paying over the life loan is much, much less than the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. The only problem with most of us are paying online now, and I, but I notice online when I make a payment, it's, you know, do you want to make any extra payment and where do you want it to go? Mm -hmm. uh, because there will come a time where your taxes and insurance goes up. And so your loan payment's going to go up. The, the loan itself will never change. The life of the loan, $1,200 is $1,200. It's the taxes and insurance that will change yearly. And as they go up, then your payment's going up. This, the, the principal and interest it's paying, actually paying for the house is staying the same. That's what's going up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So sometimes you will be asked to uh, add money to your escrow account because taxes have gone up and that, that is a different scenario. Yeah. What's the next question? Um, so is, you know, um, there's a lot of conversation on 15 year versus a 30 year mortgage. What's the difference in good, bad, and different? Yeah, so I mean, if you can afford a 15 year, I would tell you to do that all day long, uh, mm -hmm. honestly, because you're just going to be paying a, a 15 years of less interest. Uh, the rates are typically lower on a, on a, a shorter term, so you can have a half to a full point lower on an interest mm -hmm. rate. The other thing that I really got to focus in on that is, you know, the ability to repay in your budget. Does it fit into your budget? Uh, and if it does, and you, you want to get aggressive, this is going to be a long-term residence for you. You plan on owning it or, or what have you. A uh, 15-year term is always great. Um, and again, you save tens of thousands of dollars in interest alone just by doing a 15-year term. Uh, and again, your payment's going to go up slightly because you're paying on uh, the same loan, but for less uh, number of months. Uh, so the, the payment is higher. Uh, but again, you do save tremendously uh, in the long run on the interest. I mean, basically, you've taken a 30 year, which is 360 payments and taken it down to 180 payments for a 15 year. So you can see that difference. You've got to eat up that difference. I mean, at the end of the day, pay me now or pay me later. You're going to pay me, you know, yeah. so just how quickly are you going to pay it off? And yeah. I think you said something really interesting. If you're planning on staying in that home for a long time and the average homeowner is only staying in the house three to five years. And I think they just announced last month that the average person is only keeping a job for two years. So a person is only keeping one job for every two years and they're only living in a house three to five. So, um, you know, if you're doing a 15 year note, I would highly just probably think about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a conversation that we would have during our mortgage planning session just to make sure that does it line up with your goals? You know, we want to yeah. make sure that we're not just giving you a loan. We're going to give you lending advice. I mean, we're going to try to put you in the best situation. So that's definitely a great conversation to have. Well, and here's the flip side, just to be on the safe side. And a lot of times I will, you know, talk to my clients about this. Do your 30 year loan and have a smaller payment and then throw more money at it mm -hmm. so that, and that's another way to, so instead of being locked into a higher payment of a 15 year note, there's good reason to do a 30 year, have your payments be less, but just throw more money at it each month. It's kind of like your car, the same thing, just because your payments hundred dollars a month doesn't mean that you can't throw more money at your car payment and get that done quicker too. It's same principle. So next question. That's all the questions we have. <laughs> wow, those were good questions. Yeah. Really good questions. Yeah, really good questions. Um, what have I not asked you, Jason? I feel like I've, I've, <laughs> there's, what, what, what do I not know these days? What's happened out there? Yeah, um, you know, so uh, there's been some talk about adjustable rate mortgages coming back. Uh, you know, again, mm. that's, that's, uh, for the longest time, that was a dirty word. And uh, uh, so those are starting to kind of, uh, you know, they're not extremely popular yet, uh, but you know, as we do get into a, a little bit of a, a, a rising rate environment, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're, we're coming out of that. Our rates are going to start increasing, you know, as quickly as, like, you know, now, next month, you know, give or take. Um, but uh, those programs will become a little bit more popular because, uh, you know, that, uh, that carrot of seeing a lower number always just, you know, really gets your attention. And, and again, that's when we plan to how long you plan on being in the home. You know, if I can give you a mortgage that's fixed for 10 years and you know you're only going to be here for five, you might want to look at it. Um, so uh, again, I would say they're not the best program out there just yet because they just kind of haven't you know, put them all back out there. Uh, but in the near future, when rates uh, start to kind of creep up, those will definitely become more popular. Um, right. and, and speaking of the, the rate environment, you know, 
talking about inflation and you know some of the numbers going down from COVID and, and things of that nature, uh, and the tapering talk that's happening from the Fed. Uh, that's why we're seeing that you know the rates are, are starting to inch up. Um, so you know, a year ago, you know, we were you know sitting in the uh, high twos, you know, low low threes. You know, today we're probably you know a, a perfect credit score. Uh, you know, you're probably somewhere between three and an eighth, uh, three and a quarter to three and three eighths. Uh, and again, that's going to start kind of inching back up uh, to uh, you know, as the economy improves. And I think that uh, just because the economy is getting better, you can afford a higher payment is really what it is. Well, and and I have a chart which I'll bring out uh, next time we talk it, for every half of a point that uh, that a lot that a interest rate goes up. So I find a way to say that. So let's just say it was three today and next week it's three and a half and the next week it's four. The difference in your buying power is huge. I mean, it's, it's huge. So that's something to consider if you're thinking about buying. And I know a lot of people got really disgusted and, and tired and just decided, you know, throw my hands up. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to fight for a house. And, and I get that. It was, it was, I mean, I was writing eight and 10 offers for one buyer. It, it, it's, it was exhausting. And I get that. However, if you sit on the fence for too long, the 300,000 you were able to buy today is going down to 275, just like that. And then it's going to go down to 250, just like that. So try and find a $250,000 house because house prices are just going up. They're not going down and they're not flatlining right now. So your buying power is a huge part of this conversation. Uh, and part of the conversation you want to have with Jason is, and, and then there's that old, do we lock in today? Well, I don't think we're going to see rates go back down. I, I don't see anything on the horizon that would make rates go back down. They're only going to continue to go up. And that's not to put a fear tactic into you that, you know, today and today only, if you don't buy today and today only, that that's not my point <laughs> here. But it is a point for you to keep in mind that if if buying a home is in your future in the next year, you might want to start thinking about that or if nothing else, start saving up that money for a down payment. I knew there was something I wanted to go back and talk to you about a gift, getting a gift. And we have talked about this before. It is fine that grandma wants to give you $10,000 or mom and dad want to give you whatever that that is fine. We just get a letter that explains that you're getting a gift. Yeah, gifts are gifts are great, and uh, you know, again, that's part of what we I try to uncover in our first conversation is to, you know, are you do you have the da money down, or is it going to be coming from a, a relative, a gift, um, and just depending on the type of transaction, uh, you know, the gift is, is completely fine. So let me just kind of give you uh, another area where it would not be allowed. If you're buying an investment property, you can't have grandma give you money on that one, but if you're buying your primary residence or a second home, you can get a gift. Uh, and there's a couple of ways of being really, really creative about that that will lessen the amount of paperwork uh, and the stress that you put on the giver. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and again, that's something that we can discuss in a little bit more in detail as well uh, once you give us a call. I I think, what, again, when you think like a lender, and I don't know if that's good or bad, if it makes us all just demented, I'm not <laughs> sure. But when you put on your lender hat and grandma gives you $10,000 or $20,000, the lender's going to want to know where did that money come from? And at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. Did someone go borrow the money to go borrow the money to go borrow the money somewhere in